Good morning, and welcome to Great Kills Moravian Church on this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Um, glad to see so many faces here for church council today. Um, I do have one praise report. Lydia made it to Florida successfully, no plane delays, and is uh, happily situated in her new her new rehabilitation center. So if anybody would like her address, just ask me or my mom. The watchword for the week, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is power of God in 1 Corinthians. Our call to worship this morning, O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill. And do what is right and speak the truth from their heart who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor heap shame upon their neighbors, in whose eyes are wicked, the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath, even to their hurt. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Our gathering hymn this morning is Our Lamb Has Conquered. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I welcome you this morning. We will continue with our Liturgy of Reconciliation on page 13. Still be here, 
Amen. Almighty God, enthroned above all, you alone are God over the nations of the earth, even the planets, the stars, and the galaxies are placed by your hand. Where could we go from your spirit? Where could we flee from your presence? If we go up to the heavens, you are there. If we go down into the caves of the earth or the depths of the sea, you are there. God of all creation, we sing praises to your name. We stand jubilant before your glory, power, and beauty. God of certainty, God of truth, our confidence is in you and in you alone. Yet we live in a fallen world and we are an imperfect people. Our world is filled with pain and alienation. We know of illness when body or mind is failing and the loneliness of spirit it brings. We know of separation from parent or child, from friend or neighbor, and the emptiness of life it brings. We know of strangeness in new communities and in changing communities and the longing it brings. We know of alienation caused by unemployment or poverty or discrimination and the pain it brings. We have become strangers to our relatives and foreigners to our own families. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Let our cry for help come to you. I am a God nearby, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? I am the Lord your God. I have called you out, of, out from the peoples and you shall be holy to me. We declare your praise, the one who called us out of darkness, into your wonderful light. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to you. Together we pray, gracious God, we humbly confess that we walk in the way of the indifferent who depend on their strength alone. We sit among the scornful who deny the need for your guidance and power. Our hearts are not satisfied with riches, vulnerable to moth and rust and thief. Yet we zealously store up those very treasures, set our minds on things unseen and eternal, that our emptiness within may be filled. We humbly confess that we fail to welcome the stranger among us, we pass by the neighbor who is hungry and thirsty, naked, sick, and in prison. We sing of your healing power and your unconditional love, but we fail to make our sanctuaries true havens for the suffering and the exiled. Give us the will to be ambassadors for our savior, 
and faithful stewards of the ministry of reconciliation entrusted to us. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. Amen. Without Christ, we were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, we who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace. We are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints and members, members of, of the household, household of God, God with, with Christ, Christ himself as the cornerstone. Therefore, let us affirm our faith in the triune God. Together, we believe in the one God who has created the land and sea and heavens and all that is in them, who established a world that was good, who gives to us the task of watchful and responsible care over it, who is certainty and truth. We believe in the one God who in Jesus Christ assumed our humanity and knew our life as child, youth, and adult, who dined with sinners and lived with the homeless, who confronted popular opinion and power, who remained obedient in temptation and suffering, whose triumph was a servant's death and resurrection. We believe in the one God who comes to us as comforter and advocate, who does not leave us as orphans, who brings peace and calms the troubled heart, who bestows gifts for serving, healing, showing compassion, and doing miracles, who alone is the power and the wisdom of our proclamation. Let us in faith keep our eyes fixed on the promises of God, though we see them and greet them from a distance. We confess, we confess that we are strangers and foreigners on the earth, earth a, a people who are seeking our true home. We desire a better place, that is, a heavenly one. Indeed, God has prepared a city for us. Let, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Now it's time to present our offering. Thank you. 
Please join me for a prayer of blessing. We thank, we thank you, you, O God, God for, the for the blessings, blessings that, that you have placed, placed upon, upon us. We thank, we thank you, you for life. life. We, we give, give you all that we are and give back a portion of what, what you have entrusted to us. We dedicate these gifts to you. Amen. Amen. Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Micah chapter six, verses one through eight. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord's. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Our 
The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. Christ, the wisdom and power of God. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boasts in the Lord. Praise be to God. Our gospel lesson comes to us from the book of St. Matthew, chapter 5, reading verses 1 to 12, and we will read responsively. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. For those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Thank you, dear God, for this day. We ask that you give us the ability to be just always, to be kind and walk humbly and walk with humility in all that we do. This we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. My words today are based on the book of Micah, chapter six. And my focus will be verse eight, where the prophet Micah lamented about the conditions in which he observed among the Israelites. He reminded them about the righteousness of the Lord and how the Lord redeemed them and brought them out of bondage. You see, God saw that they showed no appreciation he saw that they moved away from him. 
Michael also observed a decline in social and economic well being for some. There was a great disparity between the rich and the poor. Political pressures were all around. Many were powerless, and nations fought against nations. He reminded the people how God cared for them and of all that he had done for them. So he said to them, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. The covenant of God was broken. His standards were violated. There was no justice, no mercy, and no humility among them. So to me, when he used the word, but, it indicates a simple request. In other words, I have done so much for you, and I only ask for something simple. The very least that you can do is to reciprocate for the grace and mercy that was given to you. The requirements are three things, three things in which I hope to examine. They are justice, and we have spoken about justice many times, and I think in these days we cannot speak too much about justice. So they are justice, mercy, and humility. First, justice. To be just is to be fair in all of our actions. It is to treat everyone fairly. It is to refrain from taking advantage of the poor and the disenfranchised. It is to refrain from racial and all sorts of discriminations. It is to provide equal opportunity for all of its citizens. In our own society today, we see these things. Micah is speaking to us today as he spoke to the people centuries ago. God saw that justice was not served. Fairness, equality, impartiality, righteousness. These are not evident in many cases. Do we not see this today? We may ask, what does this look like? How do we see these issues in our society? Well, we see them. We see them through the eyes of those who discriminate because of one's race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, and a myriad of other things. We see them when those of our society are not treated fairly and on equal ground as those who are not like them. So to be just, is to realize that we are all God's children with the same grace, the same grace from him. Equality is to be sure that basic needs and equal opportunities such as education, housing, childcare, and elder care are basic to all. To be fair is to ensure that education for children in poorer communities is the same quality as the more affluent communities. What God requires is for us not to stand back while people are living in substandard housing conditions. What God requires is for government and society to provide adequate health care for all. This means general care of all people. Secondly, Micah invoked upon them to love mercy. In other words, be kind, be compassionate to those who are in need. We see those in need in so many ways and so many situations. We see homelessness, people sleeping in cardboard boxes over a heating grade next to a high rise of condominium building. We see someone along the highway with cardboard sign reading, help me, God bless you. We see immigrants bust into our neighborhoods, <clears throat> needing everything that we may take for granted. Do we see that we are blessed? And so we should show mercy 
to others. I would be remiss if when talking about mercy, and I'm sure many preachers today may be talking about the same subject. So I would be remiss if we don't look at what happened in the news these last several weeks and what we saw the last two days where God's children beat and murdered one of God's child, one of God's children. Should we not be asking, where is the mercy there? Should we not see that what God requires was mercy and it was not given to Tyree? After all, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, I thirst, even in the light of being crucified, when Jesus said, I thirst, he was given something to quench that thirst. Someone showed him mercy at that point. Show mercy is what God requires of us in all situations, no matter who they are. Mercy, concern for the less fortunate, concern for those who are being taken advantage of. God requires this of all of us. So that is what Micah meant when he says, love mercy. We need to love it in everyone and in all situations. Thirdly, Micah says, walk humbly with God. To be humble is not to be arrogant. It's not thinking too much of, too highly of ourselves, not being egocentric. We are in this world not to think that it's all about us and not be considerate of others. We are here for a higher calling. To walk humbly with God is loving him it is to engage and think of God in all that we do. Think about it when we have to do anything. Is this what God wants us to do? Is this how Christ would do it? Humility is to accept the goodness that God has given us without envy or displeasure, without thinking that we are special because we received something. There are times that goodness is shown to us and we want more. This does not please God. Humility is what pleases him. To accept his grace and not think that we had something special to do with it. That's what pleases God. We're not so special. We're all treated the same and we all get that grace from him. In all these things, do we understand that these are the things that are required of us from God? Do we understand that this is how he wants us to live? We are reminded, we are reminded, just as Micah reminded the people of his day, that we are the recipients of God's grace. And because of that grace and mercy, we should give back by exhibiting these qualities. We cannot. We cannot take God's gifts and go our own way without thinking about what it means for us. We must remember that these qualities are not requirements for salvation, but it is the grace of God that gives us salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. However, he expects that because he gave us that gift of grace, he expects, he expects that we reciprocate with these simple desires that he placed on us. In John chapter 15, verses four and five, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. The branch the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Jesus also said, I am the vine, you are the branches. 
He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. We need to do what is required of us to be in favor with the Lord. What does God desire of us? In reality, we may say, or we may believe that it's a whole lot because it may go against the way many of us live. But still, goodness. I don't know of anyone who has nothing good in their life. So because of the goodness that God provides, he has the authority to tell us how to live. He has given us gifts to use to help others. He's telling us what is good and acceptable to him. If we are true believers, we must encompass these things in our everyday lives. Matthew chapter 25 says, I'm sure you know it, you've heard it many times. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. <clears throat> I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. These are what makes us righteous to do God's will and to follow the examples of Jesus. These are the requirements. We are challenged to do God's will and build Christian character. We are reminded of Jesus's command to love God with all of our heart, our heart, our soul, our mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if these things are followed, if these things are followed, I believe that that's what God requires of us, that what God requires of us would not be so hard. It wouldn't be hard to do. We would see injustice and speak out and do something about it. We would see need and place our hand out to help. We would always walk in the footsteps of the one who God sent to give us redemption. What does God desire of us? He desires that we take this checklist from Micah and look at the circumstances of the world, the intolerances, the selfishness, the cruelty, and walk with God and make it something for us to live by. The righteousness of Christ allows us to do so. It places us in the position to receive many blessings through Jesus. If we are to remain true to God, and if we say we love God, we must own these traits and project them to those in our society whom are not cared for. If we say we love God and we say that we are committed to do his will, all the politics, the dishonesty, the hatred, the selfishness, the trying to get ahead at the expense of others will not be a part of our lives. Sincerity. If we love, we show it by our actions, which will show God's love in us, and we will be doing his will. How can we make these desires of God work in our lives for his glory, to his glory? How can we? We make them work by accepting Jesus as our savior. We give our lives totally to him. We strive to be like Jesus, showing care, much care. It is our duty, our duty to each other. It is what we are called to do as Christians. 
And this is the direction in which God's grace leads us. So what does God really care about? Does he care that we have an abundance of whatever it is we have? No. He cares that we do not store it up for ourselves. Does he care that we have a high position in government? No. He cares that we use it justly. He cares that our character is good. He cares that we appreciate his saving grace through Jesus Christ. These expectations are not unreachable. They're not unreachable if we place our trust in him. Salvation is ours to be had. However, we must show that we are deserving and appreciative of it by exhibiting these characteristics. What does the Lord require of us? What does the Lord require of us? We know the answer. He requires, but to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Amen. Our hymn of response. 628 verses 1, 3, and 4. Rise up, O saints of God. Rise up, you saints of God. Please consider, think of what God requires of us as Christians, as brothers and sisters, and act accordingly. Please receive the benediction. Light of the world, empower us to carry your light to all. Make us beacons of love and encouragement, filled with patience and humility as we serve the world around us. Go in peace, my brothers and sisters, showing mercy and humility in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our parting hymn is um, 690. It might be a new hymn to us, so I'm going to ask Brother Stan just to play um, one verse so we can get the gist of it and hope we can go through it. Thank you.